Okay, so um, this is the first. First of all, this is the first time I've ever done this. So anyone. Well, you're do You are doing really well so far. So you're far, very, very really, good. Really, you're very good. Very professional. Very and professional. we should just say to everyone that Josh has just been on stage all day long filming something at the National Theatre. So I think he deserves a big round of applause for that. Yeah, so thank you, thank you, Josh, for doing this. Thank, thank you, Josh. It's uh, what this is possibly um, my happiest moment I've ever had. Looking at two of my favourite people, <laughs> both of whom I've been so incredibly blessed to work with and call my friends. So, I, I mean, I'd like it if we could just have a chat about what we've been doing, but. Well, I we, guess we should talk about we're, Ammonite. We're, we're here to talk about Ammonite, which, um, to give everyone a background, I was very lucky to see it um, a little while ago, um, and Francis kind of uh, got it over to me. And as far as I'm concerned, it's um, it's a masterpiece. And from an actor's point of view, Kate's performance and Serge's performance are incredible and mind-blowing and completely transformative. And I've got to know Kate a little bit since, and um, it's just completely different character. It's kind of extraordinary. So in terms, firstly, Francis Lee, um, what, how did this come about? What was the, you obviously made God's Own Country. How quickly after did you know that you wanted to write this story? And, and how does it start? Um, well, it was actually when we were promoting God's Own Country and we were touring around the world and the UK and doing a lot of promotion for God's Own Country. And I was looking for a gift, a polished stone or a fossil for a friend at the time. And um, I kept coming across this woman's name, Mary Anning, Mary Anning. So I read about her and I was instantly struck by her circumstances. Here was this working class woman born into a life of poverty um, in an incredibly patriarchal class ridden society. And, and through her own ingenuity, self-taught knowledge, determination, and this real sense I had that she had this will to survive became what we would now call one of the leading paleontologists of her generation. Um, and, it, and it was those circumstances really that really propelled me to investigate what that must have felt like to be a, a woman, a working class woman, in this very, very strict male dominated world. Um, and as she, as, as, uh, she progressed in, in her life and her career, men would come and buy her relics, as she called them, her fossils. And they, were, they would reappropriate those finds for themselves. So in her lifetime, she never had any recognition, really. Um, and, and it was those circumstances um, that that really pushed me to to look at her. There were very there were very little parallels between Mary's life and my life. Uh, you know, I'm not saying I was as brilliant as Mary Anning at all, but you know, I I grew up in rural northern um, England, into a very working class family, didn't have access to a great education, and. Um, Always knew I wanted to write and direct, but just just didn't know how I could get to what looked like a, a very kind of privileged profession with, with that was populated with people who weren't like me. Brilliant. And Kate, what in terms of your how did you first of all, how did the script come to you? And what was your sort of first impressions? What was the kind of what grabbed you about Mary and and Francis and this film? Um I'm so excited to be talking to you, Josh, actually. It's such a just a great a great it's just a great opportunity though, because when we normally do Q and A's, it typically isn't an actor and a director who, or a director who's asking the question. So it's just a uh, a lovely little sort of um treat as yeah. uh, part of how we're doing this press. Um uh I was sent the script and there seemed to be some degree of um, urgency around it at the time. I received it um, quite late in 2018. I was filming something else um, that was quite difficult, this other thing I was filming. And uh, I, I always have a little bit of a hard time reading other projects when I'm working on something else. But but my agents, who I've been with since I was a teenager, both said, look, you really, can you just please try and read this quickly? Because uh, the director, Francis Lee, um, really wants to move forward swiftly with um, a production date and uh, 
it would be helpful if they had some um, idea as to whether or not you feel you might be interested. And and I and I had I had actually I just finished work for the day. I was I, I was very tired and, and just thought, God, I just have to read it at the weekend. I thought, no, actually don't. And I, I read it now. And I had seen God's Own Country and um and had been truly, truly blown away by it and by both of your performances and the writing and the directing. But it was the the rhythm and the energy and the sincerity and purity of the connection between the two central characters in God's Own Country that made me feel so inspired to just immediate. I was so excited to read Ammonite because of um, of your film. And and I, I read it at three o'clock in the morning and said yes when everyone else woke up. Um, and I and I was I was very I was daunted. I was daunted and and I thought, who is this Francis Lee, this this sort of new kid on the block, even though he, yeah. he's actually an old fart. Um, but <laughs> but, um, but there, there, there is something very unique about Francis's rhythm as a, as a filmmaker um, that I, I hadn't seen in, in a very long time. And 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 I, I know that I haven't been in a film like God's Own Country and what I felt. Ammonite might also be be like um, based on what I had seen, um, but I had this sort of overwhelming feeling that, quite selfishly, I just thought I can't let someone else play this part. <laughs> I just knew I would find that really distressing, um, and it was very clear to me that that the only person who could play Charlotte was Sir Sharon, and I sort of didn't dare think it, just in case Francis wasn't thinking the same thing. <laughs> And within 24 hours of reading the script, we had our first conversation and he did reveal that absolutely he believed that Saoirse was right for Charlotte. And so I was just doing backflips from the word go. Um, and then sort of creeping up on Mary a little bit. Uh, I had a good few months to prepare, which was really lovely. Um, and just trying to make her my own, which was tricky because people do have quite strong opinions about who she was, people who are... It, who, who move in geological circles, people who are from Lyme Regis, they, they, they feel very strongly about Mary as though she's one of their own. And so I felt the responsibility to honor the essence of who she was um, in terms of her work and in terms of how she lived her life. But at the same time, I felt I had to add a certain degree of grounded backstory that perhaps might not have been written about. Um, and for me, that came into play when I read about the loss of a lot of her siblings, but in particular, her connection with her father, who had died when she was um, about 10 or 11 years old, quite suddenly. And he had taught her everything that she knew about fossil finding, about paleontology. And it seemed to me she had a very um, special bond with her dad. And I actually have a very special bond with my dad. And that's not something I've ever been able to explore on screen before. Um, and the loss of her father for me signified a huge turning point in, in Mary's emotional life from which point on I, I, I believe she had sort of certain emotional chips that were then therefore missing and a, and, and a little bit of an abandonment issue I felt. And that for me was what underpinned her um, inability to, to openly love freely, to um, function in social circles with any degree of confidence. Um, and also not knowing how to express real love or, or a little bit of natural envy or perhaps sometimes jealousy without it coming across in quite a clunky and awkward emotional way. Um, so those were the things that for me, I once I'd sort of educated myself about who she was and, and her pioneering discoveries, I, I focused much more on, on the emotional person uh, that she had become as a result of her childhood and her life. And, and massively of... long answer sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's sorry. very good um much better than my answers when we did in our country i have to say um but in terms of like preparation i mean obviously i know that francis is meticulous and kind of obsessive about creating a world that feels authentic and obviously we experience that when we watch the films because of you know the extent of like the sound design of the film and and the kind of we know that Francis creates these sort of um, encyclopedic sounds that go into his films. Was there, is there a kind of, inter I don't know who this is to really, but was there a, a sort of, um, it feels like a match made in heaven in terms of Kate, the little I've spoken to you has been about 
all about detail and that you're obsessive about detail. And Francis, I know that you really are. Um, was there was that a kind of did you know that Francis about Kate? No, I, I didn't. It was it was brilliant, really, because when when we first spoke on the phone after Kate had had read the script, and I started to describe very gently how I like to work, which is you know an extensive preparation period, maybe four four months before the shoot, where we would we would talk and we would meet and we would build this character from scratch and we would research every single detail about this person and their life right up until we meet them in the film. And then, you know, I, I very tentative, tentatively said to Kate Winslet, oh, and, you know, it would be really great if you went out onto those beaches and learned how to fossil and, did, and worked with an expert. And Kate just went, uh, yeah, no, this is what I do. This is what I love. And my heart just like exploded with, with joy, really, because I thought, oh, thank God, brilliant, amazing. We're going to be able to go on this journey together. And it was really, really satisfying because um, Kate, we, we did all of that. We, we, we worked for months and months before the shoot. And, um, and Kate did go out onto those beaches and, um, and worked with a wonderful fossil expert down in Lyme Regis called Paddy Howe and, and became um, quite the expert um, at, at finding fossils. Um, but also what was what was brilliant about that was um, while Kate was on those beaches getting cold and wet and tired and hungry and getting aching hands and sore feet, we were able to really push all of those things into the performance, you know, really, really kind of use all those very visceral feelings um, for how Mary was going to be embodied both physically and emotionally. Actually, look, I'm, I'm at my work table and, um, and this is what Kate found. Oh, I think I've seen this. I think so, I've, as yeah. she drops it, it's a flipping vertebrae. That is an ichthyosaur vertebrae found yeah. by me. Yeah. And hey, did On you, what, in, term, in terms of prep, was it, quite, was it quite exciting to be working with? Because I know that, that in my little experience, it's kind of, it is so hard now when we're making stuff so quickly and we're having to make stuff quickly and people's yeah. schedules particularly you it's like film to film to fit, and you're having to kind of fit stuff. how yeah. is it how is it finding the time to do the kind of prep that I know you and Francis wanted to do well I, the, the film that I was doing at the time that I read Ammonite was a was a small film called Blackbird but it was about um it's about assisted dying and and actually I and I had lost my own mother um just a year earlier and so actually that I ended up doing this film that was about the assisted death of a mother played by Susan Sarandon I was all sort of a mess and it was definitely part of my process of letting go of my own mom and so I was in this kind of real state and quite looking forward to truly having a break I felt like I had sort of emotionally really buried my mum finally and that was a strange thing that came as a result of being a part of Blackbird and I wasn't really wanting to actually throw myself into work again because I was really tired but it's the first time in my life where I thought, you know, actually, it's OK to just use the tiredness and be a little bit method. And I realised quite quickly that actually, if I was going to overcome the fear I had about playing Mary, that maybe I needed to try and be a bit more methody than I think perhaps I'm normally comfortable with. I actually kind of don't even like the word method. I find it a little bit irritating, to be honest. Um, uh, and, and it doesn't always work for me. And I, you know, and I, I do flip in and out of character on set. I know some actors who stay in character all day long, which I find profoundly annoying. Um, and I, I and I was able to jump in and out of Mary on the day. But the only reason I was able to do that was because I had done all of this work. It is quite meticulous work. And 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 I do like to do a lot of, of preparation. And it was adorable when when I was when Francis was saying to me, this is what we'll do. And, you know, your feet might hurt and it might get cold and we might not give you a coat. And I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> bless him um, <laughs> um, because of course I, I I love that stuff and uh and, and and live live for that stuff but for some characters that doesn't always work and sometimes letting go of the preparation and being a little bit more spontaneous um is also an okay state to be in but it wasn't for Mary I had to really you know, I had to learn to love the injuries I would sustain daily on my hands and let them be there. And in actual fact, you see a lot of them, a lot of them in the film. They were they were real. And I have a few scars um, to prove it. Um, <laughs> but 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 uh, yeah, creating creating is a, a sort of a, a backstory and a history for a character 
um, well, as you'll know yourself, you know, it's, it's, it's enormously rewarding and challenging and also an annoying because there are times when you don't want to feel quite so burdened by that person. And actually, you, I, I would have liked to have had a little bit more balance between my own life and playing Mary at the time that we were doing the film. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't do that at all. Um, I lived on, on my own from Monday to Friday without any members of my, my family. And we are a very close little unit. And that was really weird. And it was a decision that my husband, Ned and I made. I, I was just gonna have to do it for the film. And I, I lived alone. I, I didn't live near the crew or any of the other actors. I, I was able to rent this um, small, quite rattly uh, cottage that sat right on a, on a beach and was exposed to the elements on two sides. And so when there would be a storm, I would just be hit completely by this 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 weather and the the waves would sometimes hit the the bedroom window and 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 I, and I would think okay the, you know the power would go out and I would go okay okay I'm really doing it it's okay I can light a candle and I can go and make a cup of tea no I can't the electricity's gone okay that's fine that's fine I'm doing this because I <laughs> need to do everything I can to feel as close to this character as possible but um but I was I was glad that I was able to do that and, and, and filming in Lyme Regis where the story takes place and is set and is where she's from. And she's so special to people there and the sense of um, the sense of uh, sort of ownership that, I, that that Lyme Regis has over Mary is 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 really quite wonderful. And as a result, the community were really, really helpful. The people who worked at the museum who had a, a lot of the actual historical um works that we needed to look at they were just brilliant um and and we were really lucky to have them as well and i think i think sorry josh i think what was so what was so um, um fantastic for me and as you know um i i love transformative actors that's that's why i love you and and that's why i love kate and and um, and and it got to the point where i didn't see kate anymore as i knew her all i saw was mary and it actually got to the point where one day on on set, and and you know I like my sets to be to be quite small and private and, and very secure for the actors, and and one day on set at the corner of my eye I see this person like walking around the set and I I didn't know who they were and I turned to the first assistant director and I said who who's that on my set, and he leaned in and he went that's Kate, and it was Kate <laughs> out of costume and makeup and hair. And I just couldn't recognize her. And, and she came towards me and I was like, I, can't, I actually can't look at you because I don't know who this person is. Because <laughs> the, the person I'm dealing with every day is someone very different to Kate. And it, it was a really weird, odd, you know, experience. But, and and it's, it's, it was very odd, you know, it's very odd for me to see the film now because I don't recognize any part of Kate in Mary. It's such an incredible transformative, both emotionally and physically, performance. It, it, it's, also, it's, yeah. like, it's also very easy to forget that, like, for someone like me, it's kind of, I've got a slight, slight, actually major advantage in the fact that no one really knew who I was. Quite an, a kind of an amazing achievement for someone like Kate, who we all kind of recognise so well and understand, and or think we understand, and then you really don't recognise you at all um, in this film. That's, and I'm, that's really I'm conscious, great. I'm conscious we've got these, um, questions, but I just wanted to quickly ask one thing before we go to these questions from our audience, which is just a word on um, on the soundscape of the film and the way, for instance, you kind of create this sort of um, oh. through sound. So what's just a word on that before we go to Q&A. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Josh. So, yeah, I like sound is like um, is one of is one of my major obsessions. The one of the reasons I love cinema is because it's a visual medium. So if I if I can tell the story with pictures and not words, that what is what I will strive to do. And sound within that is such an incredible storytelling tool. So so on Ammonite, I worked with an incredible sound designer called Johnny Byrne. And, and what we do is obviously we record all the natural sound as we're making the film, as we're recording the pictures. But whilst we're doing that, Johnny and his team are off to, in all the locations, just recording banks and banks and banks of, um, of uh, kind of uh, atmosphere sound. So he would, they would record hundreds of different types of winds 
hundreds of different types of bird songs, all the atmospheres in all the rooms. So when we get to start working with the sound, which we do very early on in the picture, what we do is we strip off all the natural sound. And then we very, very carefully orchestrate a soundscape from all these library sounds that we've collected. And it's all to underpin and to layer what's going on in the pictures, in the scene. So all the winds are individually crafted and orchestrated. All the bird song, they're all uh, carefully chosen for meaning, metaphor, layering, and they're placed in very specific places. Um, and I love that that kind of idea that then, you know, you get this real immersive um, journey through the film with the sound and the pictures. But it is, it's, I, you know, I, John, Johnny Byrne was, was, um, was a total hero kind of going through this with me because it, it was um, a very, very um, obsessive and um, meticulous task. Um, and, and I think it's just a wonderful, wonderful sound design. It's beautiful. It's one of, it's extraordinary. And for anyone who hasn't yet seen it, it's kind of, it feels so striking that you feel very much in the place. And that's partly down to Kate and, and her amazing performance and the cinematography. And there's loads of stuff we could talk about, but let's go to the, we should go to the questions. Um, first question is from Alex Rendell. And Alex says, did Kate enjoy the dearth of dialogue? Was it liberating? I don't know what dearth means, but I, I assume that means, um, what does that mean, everyone? Lack. Any, lack thereof. Maybe that's what it is. So the, um, yeah. Kate. Um, I the mean, I, yeah, I think, I think uh, um, it was very strange uh, not being able to express big obvious emotion as this, as this character. It just wasn't part of who Mary was, you know. She had lived a harsh, sort of isolated life filled with struggle and um, and work and graft. And uh, she had she had cut herself off from the world quite considerably. So I understood why um, she doesn't speak very much. She isn't comfortable talking to people, actually. Um, so I had to learn to embrace that. Um, but the big emotions that as actors, we lean on a lot, you know, happiness and sadness. So, you know, laughter and, or joy and, and, and tears, you know, as actors, you know, we're prone to even indulging in those, in those things. And, and, and to sort of strip that away was that for me was, was the biggest challenge of all. And, and learning how to trust um, Francis really, when he would say, don't touch your face, stop moving. No, don't smile. In fact, don't do anything. <laughs> Just sit there. And there were days when I would go home and think, yeah, okay, I don't think I did actually any acting today at all. I'm sure none of what I was trying to do read. And this is just going to be rubbish. And I had lots of, of, of self-doubt days. And maybe that is because I didn't always have a lot to say. When you have things to say, you feel like you're actively doing something, I suppose. And that's what I'm used to. And also, you know, as is witnessed in this q and I fucking talk a lot and I move my hands a lot. And I'm a busy person. Mary Anning is none of those things. So to strip that out of myself was, um, that that was my biggest challenge, really. Um, uh, but I, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the experience of learning how to, convey emotion with sometimes the backs of my hands or the back of my head you know um and learning to trust that and trust the silence and trust the stillness that was a very new thing for me um but uh, but it was ultimately quite rewarding yeah it's definitely rewarding watching it um is this is from rebecca clark and rebecca asks is visual symbolism important in the film for example was there symbolism in the insects in various hey, good question, Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca, <laughs> love an insect. Um, very good. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I, as I think, thank you for the question. I, I think, as I as I um, as I said previously, like I love cinema because it, for me, it's about telling pictures with stories, and so um, every image or every detail within that image is important and 
um, is t- is telling the story or is underpinning it as I see it. So so the insects were were really important, and and um, e- each each kind of um, image of whatever insect it was was there to again layer the meaning of what that scene was or what that emotion was. Brilliant. Thank you, Francis. Um, and then a question from who should I get? Um, what about this? This is quite a nice one um, for me. <laughs> this is from Burton Cromer, or yeah, I think Burton Cromer, who says, lovely to see Gemma Jones and Alex Sekarano in your second film. Um, do you see yourself working a- with them again in the future with a familiar troupe of people? Like, d- uh, yes, I, yeah, I think that's right. That's the question. Yeah, th- thank you for the question. Um, yes, I mean, I think when you find people who um, feel to be part of your tribe and um, not only are incredible actors, but also lovely, wonderful people to be around and who become your friends, um, it, it, you know, for me, that, that's, it, it's very important to, to keep that work going, to kind of move forward with that work together. So it was an absolute, you know, delight to work with Alec and Gemma on Ammonite. You know, I, I am desperate to work with Kate again, who who hopefully has joined that gang. And and also, of course, yourself, Mr. O'Connor. <laughs> nah. Okay, okay, right. We've got to be okay, be careful, guys. We're gonna we're, we're gonna sound like you know, in-house like lovies now. Right, stop yeah. moving on, moving on, moving on. I'm moving not on. actually I, I hate you, Francis. <laughs> I hate you. I never want to work with you again. You're rubbish. I <laughs> work with any of anyone, anyone out there who's who's keen. No, I'm joking. Um, okay, and then one more. I think we've got time for one more. Um okay, this is an interesting one, and maybe this is to both of you. Um, how much, uh, this is from Charlotte McLeod, how much research did Francis do on Mary Anning? And that goes to Kate as well. I suppose, on, I imagine, I know we talked, touched a little bit on it, but obviously this is a kind of loose biopic in that sense. I mean, it's kind of gone, it's something else. It goes beyond that. So Yeah, so, I, so yeah, yeah I, I knew I never wanted to make a biopic. I, I wanted to make a slice of, 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 of um, Mary Anning's life as I saw it. And, um, and so I did all the research on Mary Anning. Sadly, there's very little written about her by contemporaries. Again, probably because she was a woman and she was working class. Um, and it was very, very important to me that whatever story I told about her, I felt respected her and elevated her to a position in which it, that she should have had in her lifetime. So for me, uh, it was it was doing all the research, but it was also then going, how do I imagine Mary and how can I respect her and elevate her? Great. Yeah. Uh, for, for, for me, I mean, I I knew I knew who Mary Anning was and I knew um, I knew what she had achieved in her life. But I didn't know um, I didn't know anything about the specifics of those pioneering discoveries. I didn't know that she discovered the first ichthyosaur when she was 11 or uh, the first winged creature um, in uh, in her 20s, which then became known as the pterodactyl much later on, um, and was responsible also for identifying dinosaur poo, um, from which scientific studies then began extensively into how they lived and what they ate. I knew none of those things. so I, I did feel I needed to understand that. Um, I am not a scientifically minded person at all. I left school at 16 and got lucky as an actress. Um, uh, and believe it or not, in spite of how I sound, also come from a working class background, which people never believe me because I speak nice. Um, so, so I felt, I, I felt, um, I, I felt that it was important to sort of tick those boxes for myself, really, um, just so I didn't catch myself out more than anything. Um, but separate to that, I did want to dig as much as I could and see if I could find anything about her, about her personal life, her affection for people, be they male or female. And there really is nothing. Um, what I was able to find uh, were letters that she had written with Um, between her and women who were friends and um, with whom she had quite strong alliances and and shared knowledge. 
Um, and, you know, friendships between women in those days, and this I found fascinating, they meant something else. Um, and this was very new to me. Um, you know, nine times out of 10 in those days, a woman's only purpose was to bear children and to be married so that they had financial stability. And the fact that Mary never married and was self-taught and struggled and worked, I, I found so admirable and impressive and also she she was very accepting of her lot in life remarkably uncomplaining mm. um even though she existed in a, in a in a world that was dominated by by men she sort of accepted that that was just the way it was i don't believe for one second that she liked it and actually there's a diary entry where she talks about some terrible treachery and very sadly we don't know if that's to do with a personal life or, or a working relationship. But so it indicated to me that she certainly had the capacity to feel real frustration and to feel affronted by things that morally were not intact. Um, so I, I, I was able to dive into some of that a little bit and uh, well, a lot, as much as I could. But there, as Francis said, there's actually very little. At the time, um, the Lund Regis Museum did have one of her volumes of her of her journal what, what were they called Francis she didn't actually call them journals it was something else um there was something else that she called them a a, a workbook or uh, I can't remember what the words were that she used for them um it, it, she, she would keep accounts of things that she would find and she would write poetry in there as well and sometimes it, she would write hymns and psalms just sort of write them out and prayers and um uh she was a fascinating woman um and, and she could draw, I mean, totally self-taught, because of course she had to draw all of her finds. Um, so that was, again, something I actually had to do. I, I'm a rubbish artist and I had to, I, I worked with an artist and had to learn how to do those things. And But it was brilliant. I mean, it was, um, it was a really sort of uh, all-encompassing, immersive experience. Yeah, it was. Well, it all comes through. And actually the, the artifacts, the various artifacts, the drawings, the, the imagery of, of the world that you guys created is magic i think we're gonna to have to sign up but i will just say this that it's my it really is um my favorite film of, of many years actually i think it's a total masterpiece i think kate is mind-blowingly good in it and and saoirse and everyone saoirse else. yeah saoirse is just so we haven't talked about lovely um, saoirse i said i know she's not here but she's magic and um I can't emphasize enough how proud I am of my friend Francis and my new friend Kate, and it's just magic. And I plead anyone to come and watch it. And thank you, BAFTA, for coming and asking your questions. Um, I hope everyone has a nice evening. Thank uh, you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thank, thank, you, you, Josh. thank, thank you. you. Well done. Well done. We did it. We thank did you. It.